Okay. Yeah, we were just talking about the difference between the Discord conversations and the comments under Paul's YouTube and the, the meetup. And Tyler was telling me it's it's a lot more practical and applied in the meetup versus the, the Discord. And actually, that's something I've noticed as well from the conversations you guys have started on the Discord and from what you've talked about when you've come, come on Paul's channel. Yeah, I think part of that's part of that's just the nature of the beast, um, uh, because like all the all the references and stuff don't really work in person because it's like you can't hyperlink to anything in person. You can't make somebody watch a new video in person. Um, sorry, I'm still organizing all this. Yeah, me too. Um, but yeah, I, so so when we're in person, you have to be able to explain the things you're referencing, which I, I think makes the conversations a lot richer. Um, there's different opinions on that. Uh, other other people do like talking about books a lot, um, which is fine as well. But it, mm. uh, we end up splitting the group into different, into two different groups or three different groups, depending on who wants to do that kind of, uh, have that kind of talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. One, of the, one of the rules is if you're going to bring something up, you have to explain it and sufficiently so that people who don't don't <laughs> understand the reference can then say, oh, okay, I get it. Yeah. That way it's not, you don't get like the circle jerk effect where everyone who's read the thing or knows gets to uh, <laughs> tout, tout their intellect and the joke, other people the joke, are just I, like, I'm smart, I read books. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's kind of a lazy way of thinking really because, you know, once you get into, into deep into the weeds with, with like this Braveki stuff, you're talking about participatory knowing and salience landscape and the agent arena relationship. And people are like, what are you talking about? The, the greatest irony is talking about participatory knowing. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like let's, let's have an hour long discussion about participatory knowing and, and do nothing. I, I do kind of uh, think though that people often make this contrast between speaking and doing it, I think it's it's much less of a stark contrast than people make it because, you know, the ways I participate are through my speech. You know, there's there's nothing more powerful than having a in-depth conversation with someone or just telling someone something they need to hear or, you know, having a reconciliation conversation. You know, everything, it seems like speech is so fundamental to 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 the to the to participatory knowing in some sense, but I I guess I get what you mean when you're talking about social issues and you're just talking about. It. I think it depends on the content, or right? like what you're talking about. Whereas if you're if you're trying to work through something, that's like Peterson talks about, like thinking and speaking are so tied because you think in mm -hmm. words, and, and yeah. so if you're like one of the things that in our sort of our small group within the meetup it was we'd been talking about doing something like the discord or yep. trying to get other groups going that then you get, you get stuck in the planning and the analysis and thinking about, Oh, what should we do rather than just <laughs> trying it. Right. For, and for that's, we for get the, for the conversation. Oh, sorry. Like we get stuck on utopianism too. It's like, oh, our internet, our, our website has to be perfect. Our Discord channel has to be perfect. We have to have all the rules set up ahead of time. And yeah. it's like, it's not how the world works. Yep. And me and Tyler know that because uh, compared to a lot of the other folks in that group, we've worked in large corporate settings a lot more. Mm. So it's kind of, we, we just have a little bit more intuition for like what, what boundaries we just need to push through and not worry about and what boundaries we are important. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's just, um, you get a different, um, it's a different type of knowing once you actually start doing it, where you start to see the problems and react to them and mm -hmm. get an intuition for things. And yeah, yeah. I, I think when you were initially describing the difference too of, of the, like the, the speech and the knowing and the, uh, uh, we get caught, I think with the internet age of, of as much information as possible. And we mm -hmm. think that that's the most valuable thing where what's actually the most valuable is the most relevant information communicated the best. 
So like the less you say, like, that's what's, is it Mark Twain or GK Chesterton? It's one of those quotes. It's like, I would have written a short and letter, shorter letter if only I had more time. <laughs> and, uh, I think it's Mark Twain, but that's like, it's one of my Twain, favorites for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's true. That's true. Uh, and so, so uh, the successful groups, the most successful groups and, and discussions that we're having, the most information is gained, not by people resuscitating or re reciting whatever however you want to say it. Yep. recite reciting things that they've read from other places it's um they we get it by asking the people who especially people who are encountering some kind of problems and i don't mean this in a therapy way it's just like somebody somebody has a a, a, pro a problem in their head that they can't solve and they're like trying to crowdsource it to the group mm -hmm. and it's interesting to the group because we want to hear like we want to hear what's going on and we want a chance to kind of do a little bit of our applied uh, applied philosophy or however you want to call it. And, uh, and so the, the most value is, is, is gained when we're asking questions of, of somebody and not telling them stuff that we've read from other places. Um, that stuff, if you know it, if you're, if you're an excellent mechanic, you don't have to reference the page of the book that you read to, to show that you were an excellent mechanic. You just fix the car and, so we're spending a lot more time fixing cars, I think, than we are reading manuals. Yep. And, um, and I, think the, uh, I think this um, this uh, this question asking is also a form of participatory knowing, where you're sort of making the person think mm -hmm. about uh, in a real way what he's what he's going through, and that's the way he's going to generate some solutions. Where are you guys getting that term from, too? I've heard both of you say it, and I've, I've not heard. It. Verveki, okay, that yeah. makes sense. I haven't seen any Verveki. You're behind on your homework. Dude, I'm so behind on homework. <laughs> I haven't watched anything in two months, so. Um, the, what was it? Oh yeah, in the, so we had at two meetups ago, I think it was two meetups ago, a really, there was, I wasn't part of this group, but from all the participants, it seemed like a great one. And what it was, was this one guy He's been, he'd been struggling with something that happened just in his, um, some personal hmm. encounter and he didn't know, he was just reflecting on it and thinking like, oh, how could I have been like in the tragic sense or in like, I'm talking, I'll just say, I'm talking about personal. David. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. 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 Without trying to like the details. Well, are I, not I thought you were talking about Verveki for some reason. I don't oh, know. oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, but yeah, uh, one of the members had had a had a very intense conversation, and he was unfamiliar. Like, um, we we spent we spent about an hour kind of analyzing his interaction, this particular interaction, which really wasn't about him. It was about an interaction that he had with other people who were describing something more traumatic and he, how he was dealing with it. Um, and it was super interesting for all of us. And I think it it gave him that next level of, oh, these people are actually listening to me talk. And he kind of stepped up to the plate too. He's like, they're listening. I have to talk in a way that matters. Like I have to say things that matter. I can't just like make myself look good or something like that. Cause these people are smart enough and intuitive enough that they're going to know that I'm lying, like not lying, but Bullshitting. Lying. yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's like the, the process is more of like, I think that, you get you learn a lot more about each other and about yourself if it's one person and then you're but it's not a it's not a debate or it's like it's not even a dialogue right it's a it's a reciprocal process of asking they say something and then you ask a question to get them to clarify their their thinking and their articulation of the problem and then in you keep just repeating that process and it sort of it draws the person out for themselves and for the for everyone and then you you kind of just learn about each other in that way mm -hmm. and i think that's so much more meaningful than the you know the debate or the whatever and that's um i think it's really the trust like that's a lot of people, especially, so I've been thinking about this with the, the whole like IDW conversation that went on like the other day in the discord and they all put truth as their top value, but I don't think that it's right. I think trust has to be the top value. Mm. And that's something that I've noticed in our meetup group and with the discord 
is that because everyone is coming to it through Jordan Peterson and then Paul and, and mostly people who are hardcore uh, devotees and have gone through all the classes, gone through, you know, a year of Paul's videos, like these, you're, you feel safe and comfortable that, okay, these people are, are upstanding and, and they're striving yeah. towards the good and, and that so then you you don't feel like anyone's going to try to even when you get into uh you know heated disagreement or somebody you know maybe pokes a little too hard at something then it's like but you know where it's that it's like they just made a mistake right but they weren't there was no malice behind it and so i think everyone feels that in the group and in the discord and i think that is without the trust, then you won't get, you won't get the good conversation. You won't get the, the uh, meaningful connections and interactions. And that's why you, you need that, that like cohesive element. And I think that's what, that's what it is. It's, you have this filtering mechanism and then that builds that, that gives you this foundation of trust. And then from there you can start to build um, more, but think, without that, you have nothing. You, you have nothing because everyone's just in it for themselves. I think we cut through quite a bit of that with um, with decent leadership and like leading by example type things. It's like I think I think now um, just us having randomly been on Paul's channel and like put ourselves out there for forty five minutes plus, um, random people from the Discord feel a lot more comfortable talking to me or talking to you or talking like talking to Julian. Like, ah, yeah. because and Job too. Job has been huge. Mm. Well, our faces are out there. We're talking to each other. Like people can see that we have a community that's functioning. So they're popping in as strangers with some humility, asking to essentially join our tribe or whatever we want to call it. And um, as long as we, as long as we maintain that that inner circle sounds too elitist, but as long as we maintain that core group. Um, and and maintain some of maintain our own values that we're expressing i i think i i think we have something i think we have something there that that brings people in it lets even like these anonymous folks like uh like american suave says he doesn't even have a microphone i don't believe that he just doesn't want to talk but <laughs> we're comfortable uh he's super comfortable in the discord having having respectful conversations with people on the internet which is is blowing my mind and it's, wow yeah What's going it's on with this Paul it's channel? Are, yeah. no, sorry. And it's totally public, but it's just, it's so, I guess it's so small right now that it's the only people that are finding it are like through Paul's Twitter or YouTube. So like if you're following Paul, like that's going to be a pretty uh, already highly selected group. And and so, yeah, it, it's uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, an insight here is I was listening to McGillicrist and he was he was um, talking about um, the, the the discourse and he said you know one thing we need to distinguish is the what of the conversation and the how of the conversation and he says you know practically any what should be open for discussion should be able to discuss practically anything but what matters is how it's discussed so that's where it's at is this this um, this trust, uh, yeah, this trust thing is just so big. Um, uh, one thing I've, I've done in the last few years is start a book club here in my community. And, you know, one thing I told the members last time, um, you know, the first, on the first session is just, um, there needs to be vulnerability. You need to, to open yourself up, even if you think people will react negatively. But, but you sort of have to take this venture of trust, first of all, and that's the only way you're going to have a conversation, the only way you can build trust, and the only way you're going to form a community is if you take this venture, which might not be reciprocated, but it's the only way to, to, to get anything positive going. And it's risky. And I, and I get, you know, these... I I looked it up on Amazon. Like you can get a mic for ten to fifteen dollars. That is, you know, pretty decent. 
just so that all the people who say like, oh no, you can't, like I have it ready. It's like, no, you, here you go. You have $10. I know you have $10 that you can you have buy. an iPhone probably. So. Yeah. But, but it's not like, like Joey said, it's not that it's the, it's still new and the internet um, conditions ambiguity and, and that right now on discord, like I would love if everybody would put at least their first name on the thing so that because it it would sort of drop one shield and so now it's like okay when i, I want to talk to somebody i can say hey you know like i know like um eric eric's name i know that his name is eric but on his chant on the thing it's eins null and, and it's like i wish he would just put because sometimes i want to talk to him but i want to just say like eric but then people don't know him as that. And so we have this, like, you're creating an alternate persona that I think is unhealthy. You know, it's fine currently, but in the long run, like, I think it fractures your yourself in, in like, so you're going to have this online persona in one context. And that is going to be different from your persona on Facebook and different from your persona on YouTube mm -hmm. and, and that you, you start to, you, you start to disintegrate as, as you do that across more and more platforms. And I just wish that people, I, um, I, I hope that people would eventually feel comfortable enough that they would just use their name. And if you're, if you're not willing to use your name, I can see how then you're not willing to use your voice and you're not willing to use your face but that's a good thing. That's what? a good thing. Like I, I understand the people who perform the best within this group and I'm performance is a loose term, but the people who perform best within this group are going to be the people like us who finally build up the courage to use their real name and participate. But the fact that everyone's not doing it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that they should. I, it, oh, it's hard. It's hard to describe, but it's like, maybe they, they shouldn't. Yeah. And I'm not saying that I'm saying yeah, that I, I would hope exactly. that, Exactly. They, there's a journey there's a journey yes. there and that's yes. symbolic it's it's at least it's at least important symbolism within the journey of of speaking the truth and, and all that things who some people within our group might just be supporters of us and not want to complete that journey but uh by empathizing with us and by participating with us they feel as if they're on that journey and they and they are supporters there's they're participants and uh that's not a, that's not a bad place to be yeah. um, from a hierarchical standpoint is like uh, eventually there's, there's, there's one Paul, there's one Paul in our group. There will probably be other people who gain some notoriety or people with some notoriety might join the group as well. That maybe somebody displaces Paul at the top of that hierarchy in terms of popularity, but that doesn't destroy the group unless that's the, unless we make the group only about that hierarchy. Which I what I'm so I guess that's that's probably closer to what I'm trying to illustrate is as long as we we have ideals but we don't we don't ruthlessly enforce those ideals we will end up in a place where our hierarchy our functional hierarchies make communities that are enjoyable in and of themselves regardless of your position in the hierarchy. Yeah, I just see it as a barometer of yeah the trust. Like the more people that are willing to come on camera and use their real name yep. like that it means that people feel safe enough within the group that they say oh yeah i trust these people they're not going to you know um smear me or try to try to do anything it is still it, the internet it is still risky yeah, we're, yeah. Doing, <laughs> what we're doing using our real names is is a risk it's and a risk i think I've decided i'm willing to take i think you've decided you're willing to take it but everyone should probably not yeah and i think it's that's at least the, the voice chat is like the first step because mm -hmm. you can still have your, you can still have your, your screen name. Mm -hmm. You don't have to use your face. Right. But there is that vulnerability still where that's your voice. And, and it's not, it's not that any, no, nobody else is really going to um, be able to say, Oh, you hear that? That sounds like so, right. So you're not really risking that, but in your head, you know that it's your voice. And so you, you still feel oh, that, like you're still putting yourself out there uh, in a way that I think is, it, it helps that process 
uh, of, of feeling more comfortable. And then people can recognize your voice. If you do the voice chat a few times, they'll see you in there, they'll hear it, and they'll say, oh yeah, that's, that's Matt, or that's so-and-so. And, and, you'll, and it's so just through the recognition of each other's voices, you do build that human connection, yep. despite not seeing their face or knowing their name. Um, sorry, this is, I feel a bit rude for doing, but what do you guys mind segueing now to the, uh, to the, to the other discussion I was, was going to have, uh, I think I, it feels like we've sort of inadvertently gotten into this in some indirect way where it, it sounds like what's happening in, through the meetups and through this discord and through this vulnerability and trust and building community online is actually a way of addressing the meaning crisis in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so maybe one question to start with is how would you guys define the meaning crisis? Um, and, and I'm not really looking for an academic 15 words or less, <laughs> as many words as you like, but yeah. what I'm looking for is, is sort of the more of a personal experiential definition rather than, you know, just quoting John Bravicki. Um, so I'll, I'll go, I'll hop into like kind of the, the order and chaos dichotomy that's very popular, like in the Jordan Peterson verbiage. Um, so it, I, did, I did another recent meetup in Alameda and we had several people talk about how they kind of loved chaos a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think that's where the dichotomy fails is that it's, it's people see it as, people see it as a, a spectrum. It's like you're either, you're either in chaos or you're either in uh, order. I, I rethought of it as they were talking about that. And I see it more as like towers that are supporting each other. Um, if you want to have the most interesting stuff happen in your life, you have to go out the furthest into chaos that you can to, you know, do the whole thing, the fight, the dragon, get the gold. I know it's kind of a cliche at this point, but like to, to address the chaos, you need as much order in your life as possible as well. So now you have these, these two structures that are leaning up against each other, order and chaos. And what's happening is that people are finding the order too oppressive because the order is so safe that they don't feel like they want to go out into the chaos and confront it. And now they're stuck in this order and they think that the only way to, to bring, bring a reasonable amount of chaos into their life is to deconstruct the order. And when you're left with no order, then you have nothing to lean up against chaos. So then either your life is at the bottom and that's kind of like sterility or your life, you deconstruct the order and you aren't able to deconstruct the chaos and the chaos just falls on top of you and destroys everything. And so that's, I think where I, I I'm going to speak mostly about younger men, like I'm 30 ish, 30 year old men who are grew up on the internet uh, didn't have as much background in, in terms of like uh, all the social structures are falling apart. All the, everything that was supposed to be there for us is no longer reliable. Um, so that order is gone or it seems to be gone and the chaos could be either overwhelming or we're in this portion where the best move is to not play. And that's not fun either. Um, can I, let me, let me, can I just throw something in real quick? Um, just what you said is grew up on the internet. And I think that's actually the, the next generation. But what it really is, is that our, I mean, how old are you, Julian? Uh, 20. Oh, oh really? You look old. <laughs> 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 this guy can't even drink. Uh, no. Oh, I come from Canada, so I'm good. Oh, yeah. Okay, well, <laughs> for Joey and I, like, we're actually, we're the generation that came of age with the internet, like alongside okay. the internet. Yep. And I think that's an important distinction because like we can remember not having internet. And, that's and, interesting in my case. Um, and, and so you might be right on the line actually. Um, or, I, I definitely, <clears throat> I do remember a time without, without the internet and without computers, but I was probably, you know, 13, 14 around that time is when the internet became a part of my life. Yeah. But just going back to what Joey was talking also, about. Well, that's also different because that was probably a 
familial decision of they said we're not giving you computers yeah this is this this has also something to do with my my own culture and where i come from so yeah. that's where that's a bit different. some of your peers or at least other people your age that weren't even your peers had access to all that stuff so like what, what we're talking about at the at the 30 year old limit is yep. Yep. um we went we went from dial up to high speed internet to constantly connected high speed 4g um, yeah and it was like i remember when myspace and uh aol instant messenger like in middle school those were like the new and, and you could uh when what was it uh internet pioneers is probably lime lime wire was where you could go and download all the music and like burn cds for people <laughs> and so that it was like there was all these new things that we were of the age where yeah. it was like well, oh, let's bring it back I, let's bring it back yeah, we're trying it out and so you're you're like your grow part of your growing up and experimenting with the world and yourself now includes the internet. Mm -hmm. And so it, it creates, it's like in your adolescence, it's now this like main part of that. And so you're experimenting in real life and on the internet at the same time. And so they're, they're part of the process together. That, how that how has changed, it. how has that changed the risk analysis of chaos and order in your, in your estimation, Tyler? Well, I think it, it, it made people very comfortable with splitting. And, and so you, you had this idea that, well, I'm, and, and it was, it was fine because it wasn't so, you weren't so saturated with it. You'd go and you would talk to your friends online and it's the friends that you knew in real life, but it sort of, it, it trained you in this idea that, Oh, I can, I can do both. I can, I, because there, there, the, the split wasn't as, as stark, but then as the technologies evolve and you get older and then it's like, now it's completely different, right? You, you talk to people that you've never met, you've never done anything. And so it, it gave you this, whereas before it was kind of like, it was safer because yeah. you were talking to people that you knew. It was safer, but it was also, it was also already the process was being deconstructed because the rules weren't really there. You didn't have the same social rules as you had in person. Yeah. Right. Uh, no one's going to punch you in the face over the internet. It's not possible. And so you had, you had like, you had the, you had the chaos part of that, but then you had the order part of the fact that, well, these are still the people that I know, but it, it made you comfortable with and think like, Oh yeah, I can maintain that. But then obviously within five years, that just completely destroys, destroys yeah. it. And so now there is no stability on the internet and people and are comfortable with it because they think that they can maintain it. But I don't. I think that 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 chaos is going to bleed into, and, and that that virtual person, those virtual personas will bleed into your real life uh, person and, and your yeah. way that you interact with people. And well, I think, yeah. Yeah. I feel like Instagram. Think about um, how you, you know, this is something I've experienced where you know you've met people on on Instagram or. You know, it could be someone you know vaguely in real life, but you, most of what you know comes through their curated image on Instagram. When you suddenly meet this person in real life, it's like you suddenly, you connect this person with their Instagram um, username. So, you know, this, this person could be called, I love peanut butter on Instagram. And suddenly you see this tangible physical person, you connect him with the name, I love peanut butter. And then <laughs> you, you project all of, what you've seen on Instagram onto this person and how you're interacting in real life with the Instagram person. So it's sort of something you have to, as you learn to meet the person, you have to sort of deconstruct the, the Instagram personality and sort of overcome that and learn to know this person as a real person. Um, which for me, that's not something I've had to deal with too much because I've, I, I, I'd say I've, never really met i haven't met many people online most of the people i know i've met in real life so that disconnect isn't too severe for me go ahead joey continue with what you're so like the 30 year olds because i think you have more uh let's say data points mm. you've, been to, you've been to a bunch of different cities you've yeah interacted um, with different people so it's it's like the young the young professional thing especially um so 
there's always been people that are at the absolute bottom rung of the ladder. That's true. Um, that's always going to continue. There's always going to be homeless people and mentally, uh, mentally debilitated people who need help. Um, and that's where a lot of our charity, that's where a lot of our community events and stuff like that is focused on helping them. That's great. Um, what's missing in society is the core structures that keeps the, the middle together. Um, the, the churches are dying. Um, the churches were where everyone gathered and interacted with each other and made those friendships that then when they wanted to do a help the homeless event, that's where they, they started from. Um, so I think, I think the meaning crisis comes of people only have these corporate level kind of consumerist culture types of, I don't know, like, uh, it's, it's it's too hard to describe sometimes, but I think I think I'm getting close enough that we could that anyone listening would probably feel what I'm talking about. It's like well, it's like, uh, it's like uh, you go to Whole Foods and they say, "Hey, would you like to donate?" Yeah. Would you like to donate a dollar? Yeah. To- what what five k is going to bring meaning to my life? Five k. Yeah, that that's like so like, common. Where- so you're sort of saying the the corporate world is sort of replacing the role of the church or. And, I'm not completely following the thread. Could he? That, that, that's that's kind of accurate. Yeah, the corporate world is taking the place of the church, and then all the events are turning corporate style, and they don't have the same innate. They don't have the same innate fulfillment that probably churches and religious organizations brought with them when they were doing these things. So it's 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 like it, an excellent an excellent comparison would be like it's it's like sugar. It's it's the calories of what you were doing before, but it's none of the nutrients. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it'll keep you alive. Uh, it'll, it's something to do, uh, but we're, it's making us all sick. So, excuse me. Can I uh, just recap what <clears throat> Joey was just saying? I sort of hear two things. Um, you know, one is that we're sort of offloading our desire for meaning and for meaning to sort of corporatism or, or consumerism is, is maybe one aspect of it. And the other is that all of our relationships are, or all of our um, um, social settings are becoming more bureaucratic or corporatized in some sense. <clears throat> um, would you add anything to that? Yeah. Yeah. I'm obviously those are, those are, um, and I'm saying them, but like I'm saying them as an oversimplification, um, like it's more complicated than that, but, but that's pretty close. And, um, uh, sorry, go ahead, Tyler. I had a thought, but I lost it. Yeah. So it would be like, um, the 5k I think is a great example because it's, you, you pay your $30 or whatever, and you do it as, you know, some, your group, it's often in groups, right? So businesses will say, hey, we're going to do this 5K. Please sign up if you want to do it. And it's, it's like, hey, it's exercise, so it's good for you. And it, so, like, it's almost like they pair it with, so that's the nutrition is the exercise, the fact that it's exercise and then you're doing it for a good cause and that's the sugar and and so you're there they're they're giving you two motivations but whereas if you were doing like a a food drive or something like with your church or some community service as a group you would get those things together they'd be they'd be inseparable but in this case they're they're splitting it so they're saying hey it's for a good cause and you get some exercise and you get a t-shirt, right? And you get to hang out with your, with your coworkers or something, right? But none of those things, they're not integrated. They're all separate motivations. Whereas if you did it as, if you did it more, I guess I want to say organically, then it, it's, it's much more meaningful because the, all of those things, right? It's like the symbolism, like they're all together in one thing. And I could, I could perfectly imagine organizing a 5k or organizing an event like that still feels like the church thing felt 
but I don't think it had, like, I feel like those, those core members who are setting things up now, because they're doing it so with maximum inclusion, maximum bureaucracy, and minimum freedom in how people express themselves within it, they're stealing all of that expression for themselves. They're appropriating, however you want to say and it. They're like, and it's always top down, mm -hmm. right? It's so very hierarchical. hierarchical. You have the me, organization that runs the 5K. But Julian Hopp into it, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So let me try to, to, to recap this. Um, it's sort of like, um, you know, the, the analogy that comes into my mind is like the, you're a character in a game who wants to level up, um, you know, and, and you want to buy the, the, the neat shield and the sword and you want to increase your ability. So like you have this thing called um, charity and this thing called exercise and this thing called, um, um, you know, it, it's, it's very mechanistic. It's like, you know, I want to improve myself. I want to level up. So um, where can I get some more points added to each of these slots? And it's like, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe individualistic is another word to throw in here. Um, does, does that sort of capture what you're, what direction you're thinking of where it's sort of individuals trying to level up and um, getting benefits from, from corp versus this, this, this individual. Over, oversimplified is better than, than the level up thing. Cause I don't know. I, I, and that might be, I'm kind of bringing the, the idea of leveling up, I think is a generally a good one. I think what, um, I think, I think what we're, the combination of what we're describing is that people are trying to level up, but what they're being fed is feeling like you leveled up and you didn't. Mm -hmm. um, like again, the empty calories kind of thing, I think is a good analogy. Okay. And you're, so you're, but I do, I mean, there is, so then the, the part that you then, we didn't talk, touch on yet is like, you go and you do the 5K but then you take a picture of yourself wearing the 5k t-shirt and you post it on Instagram. Like that adds a huge, like a, a completely different dynamic to the whole thing. And that is more like the leveling up in the bad way. Where oh, I'm not so sure that's bad, but that's a conversation for a different day. <laughs> okay. Well, um, in a, in a, Let's it not is say different. Bad. It's new. It's novel. We, don't, a, we, have, we that, haven't dealt that, with it yet. That tends more towards the the individualistic mm -hmm. type of like yeah you know, yeah. I've been thinking about it's like the commodification of other people to me is like a huge. So like you're if you do that like what you turn yourself into this commodity that other people then consume. Yeah. But then also, you also consume them for your benefit of getting more followers and, and likes and yeah, feedback. Yeah. yeah. And, and so again, I'm not like, that's an interesting topic and we should write that down. Cause I definitely want to talk about whether that's a good or a bad thing. In the yeah. Future. We, I, I, I could get into that as well. Yeah. That would be, uh, but for, as far as for the meaning crisis, I think that plays a big role. And so there's a psychologist that I've watched a bunch of videos from, and he talks about social media. His name's Sam Backman. And he, talked about how social media was invented by the most asocial people because and, and he talks about so people talk about addiction he's like it's not addiction it's conditioning which is much stronger and deeper than addiction uh, and he makes a really compelling case for that for that differentiation and that he said what it does is it conditions you towards ambiguity and away from intimacy. And so that in his, like they, people will, when they're feeling good about themselves, they'll post on Instagram, but when they're feeling bad, they will scroll through because then what they're doing is they're searching for the people that were feeling good. Uh, they're trying to, so it's like this, like living vicariously through the images that you see on Instagram. And, but then the problem is that then it, it's a negative feedback loop because you feel bad. And so then you see all these people feeling good and now you feel worse yep. and it creates this, this really toxic loop where then you're like, it makes you withdraw even more. And so that's what it's like with the intimacy versus the ambiguity and with person to person relationships, 
like if you have a real in-person relationship, he says, that's like the number one threat to social media because that's the thing, right? If you're, you have a, you know, your significant other or your close group of friends and you're going to go outside and do something, that is the thing that's going to pull you away from your phone, away from the screen. And that's, awesome. that's, that's what they make money off of. And so the, that's why he says they, all of the design decisions are made to foster this fear of intimacy and a comfort with ambiguity because you don't know the person. And if you don't know the person, then you're safe. And, and, and so it, it's like, I can't trust anybody. And so therefore I'm going to have all my shields up. Yep. We can have this, this pseudo connection. And, there, and there's an inverse relationship between how good of a customer slash product a, a Facebook user is and how well they're actually using the system. The better they use the system, the worse they are for Facebook. And Oh, it wait, depends on what level though. Would, I'm saying that the people who, be, who use it best socially. Okay. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, are, are but I was just going to, okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so I was thinking of uh, what you, uh, there's another, uh, what I see is a negative feedback loop um, going on where you're selectively posting in the first place the aspects of your personality that you want others to see. And then there's a second layer to that where you're, you, what you post gets selected because there's, there's likes or retweets. And so that makes you sort of see a pattern. Okay, when I post this aspect of myself, people like this. When I post this, oh, that's not so good. So this part of myself is actually something bad and, and, and I, I shouldn't be showing this. So what ends up happening is that there's sort of a, it, it, it's paradoxically individualism and um, the crowd at the same time where, where you sort of transform people into these sheep who are sort of finding their mold in the crowd, but thinking they're being these expressive individuals at the same time. So right. you have sort of this crowd of expressive individuals, individuals who get developed. Yeah, it's social conditioning under the mask of, expressive individualism. Yes, yes, yes. And, and yeah. so there's like one of the, the guy who interviewed uh, Vaknin, he talked about this as an example. He noticed that if he was going on a trip, all he had to do was take a selfie of him in his airplane seat. And that would be one of the most successful, most, you know, in terms of the metrics, most successful posts that he did. And he found after only, you know, he did it once, saw it, didn't even, didn't even register as like, oh, that's a good idea. Just the next time he was on a plane, he did it. Mm. And then he did it again. And then he realized, oh shit, I keep doing this. Like this is, this is really um, just a, a negative trait that I've developed just so quickly. Yep. And it just, it proved how, how powerful the conditioning of that social conditioning is where you're competing against all these other people for attention. And so it's like, oh yeah, I'll, I just do that. And it's not even a, it's not even, you know, some cynical plan. It just, the, the, yep. the structure of, of the, the landscape sets it up so yep. that you, you're incentivized to do this. And then one of the other things that they talked about was when you're trying to, what is it? Uh, What's it called? When you're trying every time you, because you have the likes or the retweets, you're always trying to compete against yourself to, to, yeah, to yeah. do one better. And so you get escalation, you get this. And so you get, you, you become more extreme in all of your, in all of your activities. And so that also um, leads to this uh, splitting of yourself because you, you can be more extreme online but you, you don't have the same con you have you don't have the same constraints as in real life and so you can whether it's and then anger right like angry things are shorter hmm. shorter sentences faster communication in, in the brain and, and that that's why twitter restricted the number of characters because it incentivizes anger and that's, and that creates that it's stickier. Right. Yeah. And so people will, they get that, they get that high 
from being angry and then posting the thing and then it, it just feeds back on itself. So like there's all of these negative feedback loops built in to all these systems and people then it makes them more afraid of putting themselves out there of being vulnerable because these things and so then they start to think they start to be conditioned to think this is bad i don't want to make myself vulnerable probably in both directions as well because they and they don't want to stop attacking yes and so it makes you it makes you afraid of being vulnerable Wow. And then you can lash out at other people. Mm-hmm. And if, I, if I can't express anger in a way that I've been trained to only express anger, what do I have left to express? And the answer for many people will be not much. And so then it makes you, as you fear intimacy more, mm-hmm. you will use the, the platform more, which then makes you fear intimacy more. Wow. And then you use it more. And then you get angry and you lash out at people and you're still using the platform all the time. And it, and it just, it, it, it's really, it's that the reciprocal narrowing that John Bervaki talks about is yeah. so, it like perfectly describes it. Do you yeah. know what that is, Joey? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it makes sense. Mm. Mm. Um, so, to, so to, we need a Facebook reformation. Should we just like, you know, delete some, it? Yeah. Just delete it's, right, it. it's, it's only like two hours away, Joey. Let's go. Yeah, I know. I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll write up, we'll write up some, uh, some, you know, list of grievances and just uh, nail it on their door. The doors aren't made of wood yeah. anymore. This is a problem. Yeah, Martin Luther okay. haircuts. Break the glass. Yeah. So. Uh, um, so here's, this isn't quite connected to what you were saying, but it's connected to something we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, when you described how the, these corporations are sort of set up these events with these benefits, you know, donate to charity, um, feel good while exercising, connect with others. It's like they're taking these social goods, removing them from their the context they're supposed to be in, and um, sort of trying to 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 make people connect with them in the abstract. Does that does that that sort of? I, I mean, it's it's actually what like I think the um, what the social justice warriors would call colonization, like they're taking over parts of culture yeah. and then you only have a limited amount of time. So then you only do the charity events through your corporate culture. Yeah. I, I can't think of anything really more disgusting. Um, well, this remind I can think of something more disgusting. Well, I, I can't too. I can't think of any, <laughs> I mean, of any way I mean, of doing along this, along the same vein of thinking, yeah, yeah. think about um, the connection between corporatism and social justice. Yeah. Where what's happening now is they're, they're taking the, so the, the social good, which is now at the top of the hierarchy of social justice and connecting that with products. So you take the infamous Pepsi commercial or one example that always comes to mind is something like Tentry, which is this, this company, which um, sells these, these, these hoodies with, with a 10 and they, they, they plant 10 trees for every hoodie you buy. Um, and it, it's like this, this weird connection between corporatism and yeah. social justice, like, and the, the social good of planting a tree physically, tangibly has now been abstracted and connected with a product. Yeah. So and can that be done healthily? Possibly. Is it? Probably not. Yeah. Yeah. That's, a, yeah. it gets a bit more complicated, but yeah. yeah. Well, and that's the thing. It would be one thing if the company was actually planting the trees, mm-hmm. but that's not what's happening, right? They're just outsourcing it to someone else. They're funding at like a massively discounted rate. And then the, the, to be able to say, hey, we planted 10 trees. They didn't go out and actually, it's not like the founders of the company are then going out and planting trees, like where they say, hey, we're gonna do for every, tr- every shirt or every yeah. hoodie that we sold this year, then at the end of the year, we're actually going to go do it. Right. And then you can use, like, I'd be fine with that if it was them doing it and then they want to use it to promote themselves and for a cause that they think like, that's fine because you're actually doing yeah, it. Did everyone just lose all their carbon offset credits in the, in the Amazon? So like, I think, I think <laughs> they have to rebuy all your carbon assets credits for the last three years. Like, the Amazon burnt down. So, and the thing that, uh, it's not just the products but it's the corporations themselves. And this goes back to the meaning crisis because the number one thing that businesses are struggling with 
is their millennial employees and retaining them, hiring them. And all the advice is millennials want to work at a place where they feel they're working towards a higher purpose. And so higher purpose is just this. Because they're skipping a step. Millennials want a higher purpose and businesses say we could provide that purpose for you. But yeah. Exactly. No, but that's exactly what it is, I think. Like they're, they're doing it. The business is doing it cynically. And the participation saying, trophy of meaning. Yeah. <laughs> saying, oh, hey, you know, we want to, we need to hire people. We need to retain them. You know, uh, turnover is expensive. And there's the, we're, the advice we're hearing is that people need to know that they're working towards a higher purpose and they want to know what the corporate values are. Like corporate values is uh, a thing nowadays, right? That, that was never before. It was like, what was the corporate's values to make money? Right? We, like, and we've talked about this several times though, is like, the corporate values look good at first when you're just fresh out of college, but as soon as you're involved in them, they're so empty and so fast. Yeah. It's like the, it's like the video game room at Google mm -hmm. that is there so that the people visiting Google say, Oh, that's so cool. But yeah. then nobody ever plays and you don't learn yeah. that until you're already in the company. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, Oh, ping pong table. That's never it's, used. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, and this, um, this, this, this creating of a, of a corporate narrative, which you then find your place at the end, you know, uh, right. It's most, a religion. It's a corporate yeah, religion. Yeah. Corporate. Really what it is. And, and you have, so you have your, you have your values, you have your, 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 your goal, your teleology. Yep. Right. And, and so you have, it's, and that's all, it's like tangential to the product because you're, it's, it's not, and that's sort of like, sometimes you have companies that will tie it directly to the product. Now, so well, like, that's a marketing uh, thing. A company that I think actually does pretty well with this stuff. So this this is like what we're saying is like this could be done healthily. It's probably not done healthy in most cases. Uh, so a company I think does that does pretty well is like Patagonia. Um, so as far as like I'm going to give feminism some credit here. Like for, like as far as feminist values go, they've decided that they're going to provide top tier uh, daycare facilities. Which there's all the arguments that that might be an oxymoron as well. But <laughs> but. The best available daycare facilities, the most most generous parental leave policies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that sounds great. All right, well, it is great. I, I think that company is great and it would be great to work for. Um, hmm. But why it's great is because everyone's not doing it. Uh, as soon as you expand that to everyone, then you're no longer tr attracting top tier family-based talent, which is what I think Panagonia does, is they are getting the best of the best women who on top of their value hierarchy is not only that they're good employees of some one way or another, they're also uh, family focused. And so if you want to get top tier family focused employees, you have to run a business like that. And that would be great. But if you make it a law across the board that all businesses have to provide these benefits, then you're no longer, you're just giving people a benefit that they didn't sacrifice anything to earn. I imagine Pan Patagonia pays slightly less. I imagine, like you know, I imagine there's other sacrifices that people have to take in order to work for that company, and that's, I think, fantastic because they're voluntarily doing that, like they're voluntarily making that jump. Um, now, when you do it, when you do it in the other direction, when your HR department says that the the inclusivity policies that are just copy pasted from another co corporation, the the core values of your of your uh, your, your telos and everything, like if, if all that stuff is false, you're not differentiating yourself at all. There's nothing unique about your tribe. There's nothing unique about the people within your tribe and they have no real loyalty to you whatsoever. So all that trust that we talked about, even within our own discord server, all of that familiarity, all of that stuff is just thrown out the window and lost. Hmm. And I, I think that doesn't allow people to reach the highest heights that they, that they possibly can except for the people whose personalities are such good matches for the corporate environment that they're going to succeed corporately wherever they go. Um, and that there's a lot of people that do that, but maybe that's 10% of the population, 20. It's not all of us. It's not the middle. It's not the bottom. Um, hmm. So people are getting left behind. The, the cynic in me wonders whether if you, if it's like, if you advertise the, the daycare and the maternity leave, too much, then I start to think 
you're tr actually trying to hire the people who are go who that is going to resonate with the most who are the least likely to actually use the benefit right so it's like it, I, it was, I disagree because Patagonia has a big enough name and they're, they're popular. Like they do. Yeah, no, I'm not saying them. I'm, I'm okay. just saying the idea in general, mm -hmm. like I could see it also. Being oh, this. like the, the, I think, was it Netflix who said you had as much, as much remote time as possible, or you could take as much vacation as you want and they Unlimited hired only for people that wouldn't use it. Yeah. But nobody uses it. Yeah. Because you establish like through, through the corporate culture, you can establish this. So like if the, the yeah. corporate culture of Patagonia is such that it actually attracts the least family oriented women mm. use mm. this aid family leave and daycare as an empty gesture to attract these people who then they're never going to have to actually pay for these benefits. Yeah. yeah. And, I could, so I could like, see that. I would hope. That I don't think they happening. will. I mean, yeah. I'm just saying that's a possibility. Yeah. It's as definitely as a possibility in other, more, in other areas. As it becomes more common, the, that exploitation becomes more likely because other companies see that they're offering this. So then other, they say, Oh yeah, Hey, let's yep. do this. But then they know that the declining birth rate, the, um, the have, uh, women having children later, then they know, mm -hmm. Hey, we'll be, you know, it's just like an actuarial table, right? They yeah. look at it and they say, Oh, we're going to be less likely to have to pay over the long run these benefits and we can attract the people who are the least likely to use it. And so perfect. Right. And, but it, it's more about whatever the culture of the company is. Yeah. If it's a family oriented well, we're being, culture. We're being deconstructionist here, Tyler. We just can't break everything. <laughs> <laughs> here, let's send it. Uh, it is 11. Let's send it back to Julian. Do you got anything you want to kind of close out with or any like questions you uh, want to ask? This has been great. I, I think we should do it again. I've, um, I've never, uh, I, I just find this whole corporate religion thing fascinating. I've, it's something I haven't, explored or experienced really so this is this is very interesting and and you guys have been incredibly articulate and interesting and insightful so so this has been great i i didn't know you were 20 like that's uh that came as a surprise <laughs> to me um so like that, so so part of the problem that that i'm having and trying to do whatever whatever this work is that we're doing is uh i think i have a lot of things to say to to people my age who are kind of entering their second work life um, but I don't know what's the most important messages for people who are about to enter their first work life. And I don't even know, I don't even know what I would have changed if I could do stuff differently. So if you come up with quite like, if you come up with questions or struggles, or you're hearing stories of people around you that you want some, someone who has a decade of insight on, I'd love to participate in those conversations. Um, I had a lot of fun with this one. I think you should send it over to Jeff and throw it on that. I think I will. I think this is, this is a good conversation, but but yeah, let's let's um, do this again sometime soon, and we can dive in a bit deeper. But I think we've covered a lot of ground. Yeah, I'll end with that, Tyler. Do you have... go ahead? Tyler, you want to hop in and kind oh, of close it that the commodification question, I think, would be a great one to kind of um, modification um, off of what we talked about here. Use this as the the ground to then go into launch into that conversation and that question about all of those different social dynamics and yeah. internet social dynamics. The good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and the corporate religion thing is something that I think without Jordan Peterson, Paul, um, and Verveke and um, Jonathan Haidt, especially mm. is like those are people that, give the the grammar for being able to detect like okay this is actually what's going on because i wouldn't i don't think i would have picked up it would have just felt like a okay this is like branding or something like that but once you once you have those concepts and that framework then you can really see you know, like what's going on. And I think that what Joey said, where they're, you're skipping that step where it's like you, people are looking for a meaning and then you have the corporations who are saying, well, we'll give you a meaning. It so gives a voice right. to that gut here's, feeling. That here's a right. question. Um, I, I do have to, I have to head out though. So it was, just, this might, yeah. Sure. Oh, but, no, if you got one, one more quick one, we can do this it. This is the last question. Like um, 
what is the relationship between so so you let's say you're someone who finds meaning in the corporate thing or maybe who finds a little meaning in the corporate thing what does this do for for the rest of your life like is there sort of this disconnect between okay this is my corporate life and this is my real life and this is the only place i find meaning or is there some kind of attention there um I think it's probably a healthier, uh, a healthier thing for men that get get caught in that trap. There's like that, that's too that's too strong. But like, um, it, it, it's probably the people who do well in the corporate world are high in conscientiousness. They're the people who really like their structured day. They do like a little bit of the competition. They appreciate the cooperation. The social match for them is good. You know the way the way you have to talk in a corporate uh, environment naturally matches their personality, and then they're very successful and they're happy at work. Um, I, the reason I say that's easier for men is because then you have the children aspect, which makes everything more difficult and it adds an, an additional level of complexity. Um, but I could, perfectly I could perfectly see two, like a married couple with no children, both being most happy working their jobs and then having a partner at home that they decompress with and do the non-work things. That's a perfectly acceptable lifestyle. The, the, the disconnect I think is that I don't think there's, uh, I don't think it's even a majority of people who fit that model uh, or should attempt for that model. I think it's going to be slightly more men than women, which what uh, used to be better when we had one spouse working. When you have two spouses working, uh, especially I think women are incredibly pressured to find meaning in their jobs, which if they do, I'm so happy for them. Please do find meaning in your job. But then for the women who are pushed into that, I see that as just as oppressive as ever as everything in the past that they that was being complained about. It's like it's just as oppressive to force somebody into a cubicle as it is to quote unquote force them to have children. Um, it, what do you like? What does an individual like? What does the person really want long term? What do they want over the five, ten, twenty year period? If it's corporate, great. If it's not, don't please don't do it. Figure find something else. Like let's find let's find a, a mode of being that gives those people opportunities to do something else. If I, if the the corporate meaning was genuine, and people truly felt it, I think it would work to, like the 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 divide between the work work and then the rest of your life outside of work. It if you have no meaning outside of work and you, you truly find meaning from your work, you're gonna work more. Yeah, you're gonna work harder. And so there is that there is that sort of you know cynical corporate benefit to it, but then also I. I don't think it's real. I think it, I think that people will maybe be attracted to it just kind of on first glance, but then once you're in it, you, you come to realize that this is actually very hollow. And yeah. so it, it just like, it's not like people are working much more. They're just still going to just go to their job. And, but I, I think I am, I'm going to ask you to go ahead. Jer. I am going to disagree. I'm going to say that it is some people do find genuine meaning through their work and working very hard um, and being ups, like. Yeah, but I think those people are the ones who they're the exception. Are the most conscientious already. Yeah. yeah. Right. They're the most likely to to have yeah. that. And and I would say that the meaning is still it's not coming from the job itself. It's coming from outside. They're bringing it into the job, right? They're bringing that personality trait into the job. It's, it's coming from the work and not the culture. It's coming from yeah. the having having work that they find not, not work that they find meaningful, but having work that keeps them busy. They and find engaged. they find working meaningful. Yes, yes. Like, Interestingly, we're they're, yeah. we're trying to we're trying to shoehorn in meaning via a culture for people who don't find meaning through the work itself, which yeah. that's a, a failed experiment, I think. It's like all the, uh, all the bricklayers, all the, you know, the electrical repair men, like they're not, it's not just that they're all men, they're all married men. And, and that you have the people who have these hard, these grueling jobs, they go to work every day, they find a lot of meaning in their job, but it's not because the work is meaningful, it's because what the work provides is meaningful. And that's, I think, another area where, so in their life, they have the meaning and that, and that they can bring into it. But I don't think you can go the other direction. I don't mm -hmm. think you can, you can bring the meaning from work outside. That's work. it. I think that distinction is a discussion in itself. It's, yeah. It is. <laughs> that's another good one that we can have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, All right, um, guys, that was great. Let's end it here. But this, this has been great.
Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for hosting, Julian. That was fun. That was. Let's do it Talk again. Talk to you all soon. Yeah. Bye. Talk soon. Bye, guys. Later.